very warm welcome to the European Parliament. Um, I apologize, as always, for the difficult process for getting into the building. And there are still some people downstairs, but I think we're going to have to start. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you all, some of you once again, uh, to the European Parliament for this timely conference, Tibet in Flames, the Unfolding Personal and Collective Tragedy of the Tibetan People. Are you all receiving interpretation? OK. Um, and a very warm welcome also to the panel, who I'll introduce in, in, in order. But especially to my colleague, Christina Oyuland, who's co-sponsored this uh, event with myself. My name is Edward Macmillan Scott, and I'm the Vice President of the European Parliament for Democracy and Human Rights. And I visited Tibet in 1996. I was the first politician to get there after a three-year ban, and I have followed the unfolding tragedy of Tibet ever since with greater and greater interests. And it's a sad reality that it's been over six decades since communist China's invasion, and Tibet is still occupied. Tibetans living inside Tibet are still oppressed and terrorized by their invaders. I shan't go into too much detail on this, as I'm sure our speakers will touch upon the historical and current situation of Tibetans. Only to say that the total figure of how many Tibetans have lost their lives over the years and against the communist regime is now well in excess of 1.2 million Tibetans, 20% of the country's population. In the last year, we witnessed an even more tragic turn of events with as many as 31 Tibetans now having self-immolated. This was described by Time magazine as the most underreported story of 2011. It continues to be underreported in 2012. The act of self-immolation itself, forbidden in the Buddhist faith, demonstrates the desperation of Tibetan people at the continued illegal occupation of Tibet by China. Despite that enormous sacrifice, with at least 25 confirmed dead so far, the international community has not spoken out strongly and has passed no sanctions against China. And I particularly identify here our own High Representative for External Relations, Kathy Ashton, who in my view has come far below the expectations, not only of the European Parliament, but of the international community in this terrible situation. The horrific images of Jamful Yeshi, the 26-year-old Tibetan exile who self-immolated in New Delhi on Monday, were truly shocking. He was protesting at today's visit to India by Chinese President Hu Jintao at a demonstration by the Tibetan community. We're all incredibly sad to hear that Mr. Jamful passed away this morning and can only hope that his sacrifice was not in vain. I think it would be appropriate at this stage for all of us to rise for a minute's silence in honor of the 31 victims so far of self-immolation, not victims, but sacrifices. Let's stand for a minute in silence. Thank you. So, our first speaker on this panel uh, is Rigzin Genkang, who represents the Tibetan government in exile here in Brussels. And uh, Rigzin knows, leads an introduction to most of you, but uh, she has been here for um, a number of years, and is special assistant to the representative who's Holiness the, Dalai La Holiness the Dalai Lama. And she'll be able to give us an insight into the reaction of the Tibetan government in exile to the current spate of self-immolations and the heavy-handed Chinese crackdown. Rigzin, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Macmillan Scott. Honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, 
The year 2012 marked 63 years of Chinese occupation of Tibet, or should I say, the peaceful liberation of Tibet, as the People's Republic of China likes to put it. 53 years since the first Tibetan national uprising of 1959, which led to the flight of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and some 80,000 Tibetans to exile in India, and four years since the eruption of the 2008 widespread protests in the entire Tibetan plateau, during which the Chinese crackdown on peaceful protesters resulted in the reported deaths of hundreds, arrest and detention of thousands of people. Two Tibetans, according to Human Rights Watch, were executed in October 2009 on charges stemming from their involvement in the protests. The situation inside Tibet since then has been vo very volatile and has gone from bad to worse in the last one and a half years. The first case of self-immolation occurred in the year 2009 when Tape, a 20-year-old monk from Kirti Monastery, lit himself on fire in Ngaba, Sichuan province, to stage protest after the local Chinese authorities banned the monks from observing Molam, a traditional prayer festival that is held after the Tibetan New Year. People's armed police shot him several times while he was still engulfed in flames. According to eyewitness accounts, he was then taken away to an undisclosed location by the police and his current well-being and whereabouts remain unknown. Xinhua, the official Chinese news agency, acknowledged Tape's self-immolation but denied police had shot him. Though the first case occurred in 2009, self-immolation became widespread only after the death of 21-year-old monk Pinsok in Ngaba's Kirti Monastery. Pinsok self-immolated on March 16, 2011, the third anniversary of the 2008 protest, during which over 10 Tibetans from Kirti Monastery were shot dead by the Chinese security forces. In the aftermath of Pinsok's death, Kirti was placed under lockdown, and monks were subjected to a stringent patriotic education campaign as part of a widespread crackdown in Ngaba that included stationing of several hundred security personnel in Kirti Monastery. Around 300 monks were taken away from monastery in large trucks to unknown locations for the purpose of legal education, and two elderly Tibetans were beaten to death by police while they were attempting to protest monks from being taken away. And three young monks from the same monastery were handed down prison sentences between 10 to 13 years for intentional homicide, though there is no evidence that they had any involvement in Punzok's solitary act of self-immolation or subsequent death, other than possibly seeking to protect him from further harm. Since 2009 to this date, a total of 30 Tibetans, including monks, nuns, and lay people alike, have resorted to this drastic form of protest inside Tibet in what is an unprecedented development in our entire movement. Out of these, 22 are confirmed dead, and the well-being of those who have survived but sustained serious injuries remain unknown. This year alone has witnessed 17 such cases, the latest one being on 17 March. Today, Tibet is virtually locked down and is in a state of undeclared martial law. The security buildup of troops in the restive regions is such that Mr. Jonathan Wirth's Guardian newspaper's Beijing-based reporter described the situation in Ngaba area as conflict zone. The Chinese security forces opened fire on unarmed Tibetan protesters on three occasions in three different counties in January and February this year, killing eight Tibetans and seriously injuring over 30. Those injured from gunshots have been in hiding without medical treatment for fear of being arrested by the Chinese authorities. The crackdown on the peaceful protesters has been so brutal that anyone participating in the protest is being hunted down. According to the Tibetan Center for Human Rights and Democracy, an NGO based in Dharamsala, India, in the year 2011 alone, 213 known Tibetans have been arrested and detained. According to the same source, there, there are over 800, 830 known political prisoners in Tibet today. The self-immolators have called for religious freedom in Tibet and the, return of, and the return of their spiritual leader, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, to Tibet. 21 of the 
21 of the 30 self-immolators were under the age of 30, and given the chance, they would have preferred to live rather than resort to such agonizing, self-annihilating protest against Chinese policies. But the accumulation of six decades of ever-increasing re repressive policies introduced by the Chinese government in Tibet aimed at eradicating the Tibetan national identity, ever-increasing social, economic, political margin marginalization of the Tibetans, the violation of their basic rights, and the lack of political will on the part of the Chinese government in resolving the issue of Tibet pushed these young people to resort to such drastic actions. After the 2008 widespread protests in Tibet, a Beijing-based Chinese think tank, Gongmeng, or Open Constitutional Initiative, brought out a well-researched and comprehensive report on the causes of the protests, challenging the Chinese government's claims and clearly pointing to the failures of the Chinese government's policies over the past six decades they have been in power. In March that year, when the Chinese Prime Minister Wen Jiabao in his annual conf conference claimed that the Chinese government had ironclad proof that the protests were planned and masterminded by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan leadership in exile, His Holiness publicly made the Chinese government, se se government to send officials to India to investigate, public to in to investigate involvement of Tibetan leadership in exile. The Chinese government did not produce any evidence to back up their claims, nor have they taken up the offer made by His Holiness. This year again, His Holiness reiterated that offer when the Chinese government continued to make the same baseless allegations. One does not have to look far to see the real cause of these drastic acts of defiance and protests by young ordinary Tibetans who were born and brought up under the Chinese rule in the six decades. They are neither outcasts nor terrorists, as branded by the Chinese official statements. They are victims of the Chinese government's wrong policies. In the last report of the UN Special, UN Special Rapporteur Right to Food, Mr. Olivier Duchuter, while criticizing the Chinese government's policy of relocating Tibetan nomads, clearly pointed out, among other things, 18 of the 25 Tibetans who burned themselves were actually children of herders forcibly relocated from their traditional lands by the Chinese government. His report released on 20 January 2012 called for the suspension of the non-voluntary resettlement of Tibetan nomadic herders. Mr. Dushuter further said in his report, regularly the communication system, internet, phones, SMS are blocked and that Tibet is currently completely closed to independent observers, including the media. In fact, a BBC journalist was threatened with expulsion if he reported on Tibet. Andrew Jacobs of the New York Times reported on 22nd March 2012 that Beijing, alarmed by the threat to stability in a region seething with discontent over religious and cultural controls, has re responded with an assortment of heavy-handed measures. Officials have flooded the region with checkpoints and paramilitary police officers in flag jackets. He further reported that the Communist Party leaders have also introduced a monastic management plan to more directly control religious life. As part of the plan, 21,000 party officials have been sent to Tibetan communities with the goal of befriending monks and creating dossiers on each of them. Compliant clergy members are rewarded with health care benefits, pensions, and television sets. The recalcitrants are sometimes expelled from their monasteries. Human Rights Watch called the decision to impose direct rule on almost all monasteries and to station cadres permanently in them is a worrying indication that the state is becoming increasingly invasive in its management of religion in Tibet. These policies are likely to lead to further tensions and to further exacerbate social difficulties that have been growing in Tibetan areas since 2008. These are the real causes of Tibetan resentment, and they have nothing to do with the so-called anti-China forces. Like all authoritarian governments, the Chinese government is trying to find all sorts of alibis and excuses for the failure of their own policies. They should instead listen to the genuine grievances of the Tibetan people and review their own failed policies. 
the Central Tibetan Administration and His Holiness the Dalai Lama have discouraged our people inside Tibet from taking such drastic actions. And the Kalun Shripa repeat, has repeatedly called on them not to resort to such extreme actions, but to preserve their lives and focus on education. Despite that, Tibetans continue to self-immolate. In Beijing, instead of repealing their failed policies like any other responsible government, continues to blame His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Central Tibetan Administration for instigating the self-immolation. Beijing must understand His Holiness is part of the solution and not the problem. We are deeply worried about reports of looming tensions inside Tibet owing to the excessive and disproportionate use of force in handling the peaceful Tibetan protests by the Chinese government. Against this background, we urge the members of the international community to take note of the grievances of the Tibetan people and send a strong message, of ho message that, is committed, that it is committed to help resolve the issue of Tibet peacefully before further lives are lost. The support of the international community is vital in sustaining the hopes of the Tibetan people and thus the Tibetan movement nonviolent. In order to do so, we call on the EU to do the following. To urge the Chinese government to refrain from using excessive and disproportionate force against unarmed and peaceful protesters, to open up Tibet to UN and international observers and media, to send a fact-finding delegation to Tibet, to urge the Chinese government to immediately resume dialogue for a way forward on the basis of the middle way policy initiated by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, to appoint an EU special coordinator for Tibetan affairs, to send a strong message of EU's concern, to monitor closely all aspects of human rights situation in Tibet, and to coordinate with UN and other international agencies to facilitate the process of dialogue for an early, mutually beneficial and acceptable solution to the current problems as supported by the European Parliament in its successive resolutions on Tibet. Last but not the least, we would like to take this opportunity to thank the European Parliament for its consistent support on the Tibetan issue and for the numerous resolutions adopted on Tibet. We would also like to thank Ms. Oyuland and Mr. Macmillan Scott for taking the initiative of organizing this timely conference on Tibet, highlight, highlighting the self-immolations of the Tibetans and their dedicated staff, without whose hard work this would not have been possible. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Riggs, very much indeed for that uh, important and helpful statement. Um, and before I ask Roy Strider to speak, um, can I ask Christina Oyland to say a few words? Well, thank you very much, Edward. Uh, simply, well, from my part also, I would like to welcome uh, all the friends uh, who are here uh, already. And I suppose many of you are here in this uh, conference. It's uh, third time over the last three years. Uh, we have been organizing um, uh, every year in March a similar conference, and then some of the speakers um, have been also previously here with us uh, sharing uh, their concerns um, about the situation um, in Tibet. Uh, well, uh, we will come back uh, later this afternoon uh, on uh, the concrete possible actions, but I'm very, very um, uh, glad that uh, our efforts uh, from the part of the parliament are also moving uh, at least with a small steps and, and I hope to see uh, later today here also the representative uh, from the uh, European External Ac Action Service because we need a dialogue uh, also with the EIS and, and uh, in order to achieve uh, um, real results uh, on solution of the issue. We, we should um, have a dialogue uh, with the um, uh, office of uh, Lady Ashton. But I would stop here and then uh, just pass word back to Edward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, now to another Estonian. Um, uh, Roy Strider is a journalist and author of many books on Tibet. And his book, Himalayan Tales, was elected Best Estonian Travelogue in 2008. Roy, you have the floor. Thank you, Edward. Dear friends and supporters of Tibet, Tashidele, this seminar today is taking place at a time that is revolutionary for Tibet as well as for the world. 
The world is changing faster and faster, and at times it seems that these changes are greater than people or mankind can endure. For a long time, the topic of Tibet has been inseparable from the topic of China. Historically, these two countries had close connections before 1950, when the People's Republic of China occupied its neighbor smaller in numbers as well as military forces. Today, the question of Tibet equals the question of China. And in many ways, the question of China equals the question about the future path of our world. Thus, Tibet is not only important for China or the Tibetans, it is uh, vital for the whole world to solve the question of Tibet peacefully, yet in a way that satisfies all parties concerned. I have had the extraordinary opportunity to witness the process of seminars on Tibet becoming a tradition in the European Parliament. For that, I have to thank members of the European Parliament, Christina Oyland and Edward Macmillan Scott, the seminars on Tibet have so far been organized uh, three years in a row, and it has been uh, an honor for me to take part in all of them, either as speaker or panelist. I would uh, therefore allow myself to make an interim summary of what uh, has happened and outline the results of this three years work. In general, there are few uh, significant uh, results. On the one hand, it is a good thing that such seminars uh, take place. The greatest value of these seminars is the moral support uh, for the Tibetans and their supporters. On the other hand, it grieves me to say that the expectations of the Tibetans and their active supporters have not been fulfilled by such uh, high-level events. Throughout uh, the three years in these seminars, the pervasive topic has been the critical need to send a fact-finding delegation to Tibet to get uh, objective information, show our solidarity and the European people's representative's uh, intensive interest in the human rights violations taking place in Tibet, uh, etc. I have also often spoken about the importance of sending such a delegation. The critical need for it has also been emphasized by Mr. Gelsan Kjaltsen, the special envoy of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who spoke at the seminar on Tibet last year, as well as several representatives of Tibet support groups. A short while ago, on March 10, in the traditional speech on the Tibetan National Uprising Day, the primary need for and the importance of a fact-finding delegation was emphasized by the Prime Minister of the Tibetan government in exile, Dr. Losan Sanje. Last year, uh, preparations uh, for making such a delegation finally began, and I was uh, really glad to put together the draft program for the visit. And I introduced uh, the draft program to the aforementioned uh, Prime Minister at our uh, recent meeting in Taramshala, India. The expectations for the visit were equally high among the supporters of Tibet, Tibetan refugees and Tibetan leaders in exile. The stratum of power in China changes and uh, ferments. It is either the major increase of freedoms or an even heavier iron heel of uh, hardliners of the line in the near future. In the last 50 years, there has been no moment in time that is more promising or better for supporting the suppressed nations in China, such as the Tibetans, the Uyghurs and others. Still, uh, it uh, unexpectedly turned out that the European Parliament's uh, visit to Tibet would be cancelled. As I understand it, the reason for the cancellation was that since Tibet is located in a remarkably high region, the members of the European Parliament, uh, uh, it might be a threat to their uh, health. 
good people. During the last year, at least uh, 29 Tibetans, many of them Buddhist monks and nuns, have set, uh, have, uh, have set themselves on fire in Tibet, uh, demanding freedom for their homeland. They have set uh, themselves on fire also in order to attract the world's attention to Tibet. Most of them are dead, and the fate and location of the rest is unknown. A bitter caricature is being circulated among the Tibetans in Facebook and other means of electronic media where the world's leading politicians are standing around a flame shaped uh, like Tibet. The caricature is accompanied by words, Tibet is burning, but the world wishes to see nothing. Will the desperate claim of the Tibetans the visit of an international high-level fact-finding delegation be fulfilled only when the Tibetans have somehow dug down their occupied homeland that is shaking in genocide. Hmm? Not more than two days ago, a young Tibetan activist, a 26-year-old refugee, Champel Jesse, set himself uh, on fire as a sign of disparate protest in New Delhi the capital of India. He suffered severe burns on 98% of his skin. I uh, cried when I saw the photos of his uh, despondent attempt to draw the attention of the world and the key country's politicians to the horror in Tibet. Champel Jesse died at the hospital on today morning. How many people need to set themselves on fire before uh, the seminars turn from making words to taking actions? How many people? I apologize, but this grieves me enormously. Year 2012 has been declared Tibet lobby year. It is my belief that we are past the point of lobbying with words alone. We should lobby with actions. And it is not a question of uh, whether the European Parliament is a big or a small rubber stamp. It is a question of whether the European Parliament is anything at all. Dear friends, I thank the speakers for their wise words and their heartache. No doubt, moral support is invaluable for tormented people. But today, moral support is no longer enough once more, I call for the fact-finding delegation, as well as the delegation of the members of the European Parliament to go to Tibet. To Tibet, not to India, where it is safe, or to a Tibetan community down the next street. The truth of supporting the freedom struggle, supporting freedom, is tested in this moment when noble words are accompanied by equally noble deeds. We are all here to sincerely and truthfully support Tibetan freedom struggle. Are we not? Sending a fact-finding delegation is of utmost importance. Perhaps the most vital contribution that the European Parliament can give the Tibetans and Chinese dissidents. And along with people, time burns with as bright a flame in this matter. Time does not wait. Should we, however, continue on the same course and support Tibet with just seminars that result in a press release, moral support, <clears throat> and some statements that anyway disappear into media noise, then we are all responsible for the distress and endless suffering of Tibet. Today, today is the time for acting, acting quickly, no more postponing. Please send a fact-finding delegation to Tibet immediately. Please send a fact-finding delegation to Tibet immediately. Thank you for the attention. And something more. <clears throat> I have a letter here from, uh, from the dead man. Uh, last uh, words, last will of martyr Champel Jesse, who who self-immolated himself uh, uh, two days ago and died uh, today morning in India. And uh, I'll, 
I'll make it shortly, but I just, I need to read the translation. Long live His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who is the shining example of world peace. We must strive to ensure return of His Holiness to Tibet. I pray and believe that the Tibetan people in and outside Tibet will be united and sing the Tibetan national anthem in front of uh, Potala Palace. My fellow Tibetans, when we think about our future, happiness and path, we need loyalty. It is the life soul of a people. It is the spirit to find truth. It is the guide leading to happiness. My fellow Tibetans, if you want equality and happiness as the rest of the world, you must hold onto this world loyalty towards your country. Loyalty is the wisdom to know truth from falsehood. You must work hard in all your endeavors, big or small. Freedom is the basis of happiness for all living beings. Without freedom, six million Tibetans are like a butter lamp in the wind, without direction. My fellow Tibetans from three provinces, it is clear to us all that if we unitedly put our strength together, there will be a result. So don't be disheartened. What I want to convey here is the concern of the six million Tibetans. At a time when we are making our final move toward our goal, if you have money, it is the time to spend it. If you are educated, it is the time to produce results. If you have control over your life, I think the day has come to sacrifice your life. The fact that Tibetan people are setting themselves on fire in this 21st century is to let the world know about their suffering and to tell the world about the denial of basic human rights. If you have any empathy, stand up for the Tibetan people. Uh, we demand freedom to practice our religion and culture. We demand freedom to use our language. We demand the same right as other people living elsewhere in the world. People of the world, stand up for Tibet. Tibet belongs to Tibetans. Victory to Tibet. Signed, Davu Champel Cheshi. Thank you. Well, thank you, Roy. <clears throat> thank you, Roy, and thank you very much indeed for <coughs> sharing with us that last uh, testament from Gampo Yeshi, who died this morning in Delhi. Um, now I turn to Lama Jab, who is an independent researcher and interpreter who grew up in northeastern Tibet and is now studying and lecturing at the University of Oxford. Um, Thank you very much for coming here, and uh, I will speak in English. Um, and um, I'm really grateful for the European Parliament uh, for sort of extending this rare listening air uh, to us, and for which we are very grateful, uh, and uh, we are a grateful people. Um, I would like to just put this self um, emulations in a uh, in a historical context. Um, I mean, many commentators, both Tibetan and foreigners, are quick to point out the unprecedented nature of the recent protests and self emulations uh, inside Tibet. Uh, and we note the sort of geographical scale and the um, demographic diversity. Uh, and the youthful zeal of the protests and the self emulations um, However, if we look at the factors that drive, uh, that the factors that um, sort of drive Tibetans to undertake these self emulations uh, then we find their sources in in the. The, so the sources of the current tragedy in the socio-political upheaval and the socio-political tra traumas uh, of Tibet in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Um, 
so in our haste, sort of in our hasty quest um, for the new, we lose sight. We lose sight of this uh, historical precedents. Uh, and there was wide-scale resistance against the Chinese communists as soon as they set their foot on the Tibetan soil in 1949. Um, most of the commentators uh, call for the return of the Dalai Lama and Tibetan freedom. Uh, some demand independence. Uh, it's obvious they are calling for freedom from repression. Um, the flight of the Dalai Lama is inextricably linked with loss of Tibetan freedom. And this is what many Tibetan poets refer to as the death of the wild yak, or the wound of history, metaphorically. Uh, the sort of ongoing and long-running uh, repressive rule that exercised in, in, in Tibet given Tibetans a metaphorical tongue to speak in. Um, if we look at the, then when we go back and look at the escape of the Dalai Lama uh, and thousands of Tibetans, uh, this escape, the exhaustus of Tibetans were not a sudden affair. Uh, it wasn't a sudden affair. There had been a long, bloody build-up to it. Uh, what is maybe sort of commonly most popularly noticed is the, Tibetan, the defeat of the Tibetan army in 1950 in Chamdo, uh, and the sort of imposition of the 17th point agreement on Tibet in 1951, and the great uprising in Lhasa, where these were great events that are noticed. But however, what is, little, what is sort of little known is the, were the numerous um, sort of anti-communist revolts that took place all over Eastern Tibet uh, prior to 1959, prior to the flight of the Dalai Lama. Uh, and these were protests and revolts and rebellions uh, and insurrections taking place in Eastern Tibet, in Amdo and Kham, in today's uh, Qinghai, Gansu, Yunnan, Sichuan provinces, the Tibetan areas. In these places, uh, there were serious wide-scale resistance uh, going on. And these are the places where self-immolation and recent protests are taking place as well. Um, and as early as 1949 and 1952, uh, there were armed resistances against advancing communist, uh, Chinese communist army and personnel uh, in, in Huangnan uh, administrative region, that's a Repgong region in Tianza. Um, and also in 1952 and 1956, there were resistances in Jerong. These are just, I'm just giving you just few, only few cases. And the, in the 1950s, uh, there was this imposition of socialist change known as the democratic reform, uh, which targeted uh, traditional, uh, Tibetan, uh, traditional Tibetan social system and, in fact, appended it and, um, through violent means. And this is the reason that uh, protests, that uh, resistances and revolts intensified within this region. Um, and Tibetans especially, uh, Tibetans couldn't uh, stomach the maltreatment of their local communities. And you can see a repetition of history here. And this, I'm talking about 1950s, early 1950s, mid-1950s. And a secret Chinese military document uh, records uh, that there were 996 skirmishes between Chinese army and Tibetans um, in a period of just eight months in 1958 alone. In today's uh, Ganho administrative region, about consisting of about six uh, Tibetan counties. Uh, and I quote, according to this confidential military, PLA military confidential um, document, it says, because of incessant battles waged through night and day for eight months between mid-March and mid-September, a complete victory was won with regards to quelling the revolt in Ganlo, this in Amdo, just only a small place apart in Amdo. Attached forces under our command headquarters fought 996 times, during which 
21,141 rebels were eradicated. 21,141. 8,355 guns of various types, 11,579 knives and spears, and 2,755 horses were seized. And this what we're talking about, this wasn't a conventional army. These were Tibetan tribes on the move, including families, women and children, all trying to escape. And however, I mean, this sort of gives you an idea of the intensity of military activity and the scale of resist resistance in the 1950s. And Chinese suppression of it, coinciding with the great leap forward, uh, resulted, in, resulted in unprecedented suffering, massacre, mass imprisonment, mass suicide, and the destruction of monasteries, starvation, and radical socio-political restructuring along Marxist collectivist lines. And the subsequent flight of Eastern Tibetans to Lhasa and led to the uprising in Lhasa and the flight of the, of the Tibetans to India. Uh, however, I'm running out of time, so I just would like to, um, like to just stress one new sort of angle of the protests and the self-immolations that's happening inside Tibet. And within which that there seems to be a, an emphasis on language, on Tibetan language. In the 1950s, Tibetans fought for something called Dharma, Tibetan Dharma and Tibetan territory, and Tibetan, maybe you could say Tibetan welfare, that's what they fought in 1950s. They never singled out Tibetan language that, at that time. That was because they were yet to encounter the destructive, the nightmarish cultural revolution, and also they were yet to encounter the 90s and the new millennium, which introduced certain policies that phases out Tibetan language as a medium of instruction, as, an, as a language of instruction. And hence, we, we see that a new emphasis on language, that in the, especially, you see that um, in the last words um, of the self-emulators, uh, they display a concern, a serious concern, uh, with the Tibetan language. And this Tibetan language, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about a language that has been able to not only an effective vehicle of communication, but an effective um, part of Tibetan civilization and a, a mover and shaker of Tibetan consciousness. And what is being happening is that I'm sure many of you are aware or know of a great novel called George Orwell's novel called 1984, in where they invent a language called the new speak, which is stripped of the rich English language, stripped of its rich vocabulary, to, in order to restrict uh, citizens' capacity to think and act. So we can see parallels here, and rightly Tibetans fear um, that this is an, an attempt to shape the identity and control of their consciousness through the sort of restriction of their language. Um, and uh, sorry, lastly, I'll just be quick. Um, I mean, we are informed in Weberian terms that the state holds a monopoly, of, um, monopoly on the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. Uh, and this, with regards to Sino-Tibetan relations, the key concept here is legitimacy. We can safely say that the Chinese government has never earned the consent of the Tibetan people to rule them, let alone, let alone the right to subject them to violence. In short, the tragic cases of self-immolations are the product of Tibet's bloody encounter with the communist China in the 1950s and the failure of China's subsequent Tibet policy. To put it another way, it is this failure that has led to the emergence of this new form of protests in predominantly young, educated Tibetans. Their deliberate, methodical, and measured approach shows us a steely spirit of resistance and an incredible determination to expose their dire and wretched situation to the outside world in setting their precious lives, precious physical bodies on fire. And these are a generation born and brought what Tibetans sometimes sarcastic, sarcastically refer to as born, a generation born and brought up under the red, communist red flag of China. Thank you very much.
Well, thank, thank you very much indeed. And um, as we all know, the, the role of the internet in uh, reform and change is crucial. And I'm now going to hand over to Dechen Pemba, who is the website editor of uh, High Peaks Pure Earth, a site that monitors the Tibetan blogosphere and translates Tibetan blogs into English. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to try and keep it quite short, and I've also brought some photos. I hope you can see them on the, on the screens. Um, what I want to start by saying is that the self-immolations inside Tibet since 2009 have not been well documented online. I should state this because I will be showing images, screenshots from things that you find on the internet, but um, Chinese repressive policies internet on internet and internet censorship are well known. And this also goes for uh, blogs and internet websites in Tibet or written by Tibetans. Especially, these are considered especially sensitive, and I'll be demonstrating that as well in my presentation. There's only one exception to this, um, that is the uh, writer and poet um, and blogger, Wurse. She has a blog which, on which she documents daily um, uh, the case-by-case -case, um, um, instances of self-immolations. But this is um, um, an unusual uh, exception. Her blog, um, she reports on the self-immolations through available sources on mainstream media and also from what is found on social media. But Wurse's blog is, within China, inaccessible, along with Facebook and Twitter. So ordinary Tibetans' access to information regarding the self-immolations is limited, and the Chinese government clampdown to restrict information flow is swift. Last year, um, Tibetans writing on blogs in Tibetan language, they were referring to self-immolations through poetry and prose. So this screenshot that you see is a Tibetan website, a Tibetan blog hosting website, sangdor.com. And this is a Tibetan poem that was written in October uh, 2011, and High Peaks Pure Earth translated it into English. The poem is called Morning, and the next uh, slide shows the English translation. So it might be a little bit difficult to read, but the author writes that the sadness of living is more painful than death. Unbearable sorrow turned you all into glowing red skeletons. And the poem goes on to mention sorrow and flames and talks about the human body and talks about rosary beads, this indicator of faith. And so all of these uh, words, they all call to mind the self-immolations by monks and nuns. So it may not be direct, but we can see that there are connotations and allusions to self-immolations. And when we read the poems and we read the blog posts and we read the comments that Tibetans write, the overwhelming sentiment we see is one of respect to the self-immolators. And very often when we have debates or discussions about the situation in Tibet, it's the voices of Tibetans on the ground that are missing from these debates and discussions. So what these blogs bring to the debate are voices of Tibetans who are either self-immolating or have directly been affected by self-immolations. A comment which was left on October 12th to this poem says that the light which is set on by the lives of the two heroes will shine their way, and I believe the truth will eventually prevail. So here, the two heroes could be a reference to Kayang and Chempel, who were two young former monks of uh, Kirti Monastery in Ngaba that we heard about, and they self-immolated together, and they both later died in hospital. And by February 1st of this year, this website, um, Sangdo and another website, Rangdo, they were both uh, inaccessible. So they were either closed down or they were taken offline. The next picture shows, this is a screenshot of rangdo.net, which is a Tibetan, Tibetan website. And for the period that would, uh, uh, during which this site was offline, there was only this screen and you could not access any of the content of the website. And all that it said on the screen in Tibetan, it said, for the sake of life, we are mourning and crying. The next shot is taken from the Chinese microblogging platform Weibo, on which Tibetans are quite active and on which you can post in Chinese language or Tibetan language. And it's quite surprising that you do see visual documentation of self-immolators on this uh, microblogging platform. And the screenshot here shows a photo of a self-immolation which was uploaded on October the 18th and reposted by a Tibetan. And the only thing that it says, it doesn't really make any direct comment, it just says, Om Mani Beme Hom in Tibetan, which is a mantra. It is a prayer. 
And um, underneath it, there is a comment in Chinese which says, another hero who sacrifices their life for peace. So the next slide shows more comments left on this microblogging platform by Tibetans. And the sentiments are of respect and towards the self-immolator. They are saying, this is a true hero. Think about who would burn themselves calling out for peace and for freedom. They're saying, sacrificing oneself for peace and freedom, this is rare, so these people are heroes. But as is the case for um, many things related to Tibet, there is no one way of thinking about it, or there's no, we cannot say that all Tibetans think about self-immolations in the same way, or there's only one opinion about the self-immolators. There's one comment amongst the comment commenters for the poem that I showed earlier that actually speaks against self-immolation. A blogger says, I want to express my respect to the dead and to the living heroes, but I want to say in the meantime that the body, the base of the mind, should not be offered as a butter lamp offering. And as Lama Jab was referring to, this person talks about language, saying, if we were able to keep our language alive, protect the land of our father and house of our mother, the sky would turn into blue and the sun would rise from behind the clouds again. And the sun rising from behind the clouds is a common Tibetan allusion to the Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama returning to Tibet. Um, uh, the next screenshot is from Weibo, from the Chinese microblogging platform. And this shows an error message. Um, this was from October 2011. And it shows that if you do a search using the Chinese word for self-immolation, there are no results. You cannot search for this topic. And the reason is given as being due to relevant laws. So this is the reason why you cannot search on Weibo for this term. Um, this is the uh, blog of Wurse. She writes a blog called Invisible Tibet, which is the one I started off by mentioning. Uh, Wurse and a prominent Tibetan lama who is now based in the States, who fled from Tibet, Arjun Rinpoche, and a Tibetan poet who's based in Amdo. The three of them, they released a joint appeal through Wurse's blog in Chinese, English, and Tibetan. And they released it just a few days before the 10th of March this year. And it was an appeal to, directly to Tibetans not to self-immolate, saying that life is too precious, Tibetan life is too precious, and um, Tibetans should not self-immolate. So that's another example of a, another uh, opinion expressed by Tibetans about the self-immolations. Um, I wanted to end by mentioning Lama uh, Zopa, who's from Golok in Amdo. He self-immolated on January 8th this year. And he's one of the few, out of all of the uh, Tibetans who've self-immolated in Tibet, he's one of the few who had left a uh, testimony. He recorded an audio testimony, quite long, I think around eight, eight minutes long, uh, talking about the reasons why, for his action, for his extreme action, some might say, he talks about the unity of Tibetans. So actually, the letter from Champil Yishi that was read aloud earlier echoes many things that Lama Zopa was writing. Um, Lama Zopa uh, said in his testimony, I am giving away my body as an offering of light to chase away the darkness and to free <laughs> beings from suffering. His testimony um, by name mentions the uh, Tibetan who self-immolated in the late 90s in Delhi, Tubden Gudup. Some might say he was the first Tibetan to self-immolate as an act of political protest. And Lama Sopa emphasizes uh, Tibetan unity. And his testimony is uh, very long, but it's very much worth uh, reading because it's one of the few examples that we have where we have a testimony, where we have reasons given for the, for the self-immolation. Um, that's all I wanted to present today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dajan, very much indeed for your intervention. <coughs> um, and for that interesting insight into the web life. Our final uh, speaker of this first panel is Dr. Françoise Robin, an associate professor of Tibetan language and literature at the Institut National des Langues et Civilisations Orientales in Paris, who will focus mainly on the student demonstrations which are now gaining popularity in the Amdo area. Professor, you have the floor. Have you got the technology? <coughs> Almost, yeah. <coughs> so while we're waiting for the 
PowerPoint presentation, sorry, while waiting for the PowerPoint presentation to appear, hopefully. <laughs> uh, um, my presentation is about uh, language protests in Tibet and might bring a different light until to, uh, to what has been said until now. And it's a, a nice follow-up on what Lamatyap and Dejem Pemba both said. Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, on the side of self-immolations, which themselves led to um, protests on the part of many Tibetans, there were also um, language-related protests, which maybe didn't get so much attention from the um, greater the public. The reason why I'm trying to use my computer is that I'm, I, I'm using Tibetan font and I'm not sure it goes through this computer, but I can try. So I think it's, um, it's not bad to, to remind the audience of the size of Tibet itself. Um, so Tibet is basically one, one um, fourth, one quarter of the size of the current territory of the People's Republic of China. And, and this map shows you the extent of Tibetan, Tibeto-Burmese speaking areas. Basically, it's Tibetan. Um, Tibetan language has a very long history. The uh, alphabet was invented in the seventh century. Um, that is three centuries before even Burmese um, um, alphabet. It has a huge literary corpus. Of, most of us are not aware of in the West but it's one of, was on the, one of the treasure houses of literature in the world. And it is, as Lama Chap said, a pillar. Tibetan language is a pillar of distinct Tibetan identity and civilization, and there's no question about that. So here you see a Sino-Tibetan treaty pillar, which is quite famous, and the inventor of a Tibetan script. So there have been two um, instances of protests in, um, in Tibet, uh, language-related protests. The first... Um, period came in October 2010 when teachers and students protested against what was so-called bilingual education reform. Bilingual sounds very nice. Uh, it's a very nice name, but actually it was to the detriment of Tibetan language. So thousands of protesters took to the streets, mostly in Qinghai and Gensu provinces, what is now Qinghai and Gensu, that is Amdo province, uh, northeast of Tibet. And they, res they demanded respect for Tibetan language and for Tibetan as the main language of education because the, uh, the reforms that were being put forward by the Qinghai province um, education bureau would eventually lead to Tibetan becoming an, a totally minor language in Tibetan people's education. Uh -huh. So here we are. There was Tibetan here. So you'd see only small squares. So what were the slogans at that time? Equality among nationalities, freedom for languages. We want Tibetan script. Education in Tibetan language and script must be carried on. This is what people shouted. We want equality and harmony among nationalities. And there's another one does not, that does not appear on the screen. And then uh, one and a half year later, we have uh, more student, students' protests in 2012. Um, it looks like they are taking advantage of political and religious protests to push the language agenda. In December 2011, 500 students and teachers protested in Rebkong. Well, we always have to think, when we think about Tibet, we have to think of the size of Tibet and the population of Tibet. 500 Tibetan people to gathered somewhere is no little figure. It's a small people, and when we're talking about thousands of people united together, I mean, sh demonstrating together, it means quite a, a massive demonstration for Tibetans. There are only two inhabitants per square, ki square kilometer in Tibet. So in March, March so, um, um, was a big day. I mean, March 14th to 18th showed a lot of protests by Tibetan students in mostly the same places. Uh, they protested against language policies and they supported laymen and clerics' protests, but their, their slogans were always language related. So they were almost the same slogans in, as in 2010, equality for Tibetans and for the language, equality uh, for languages and freedom for nationalities. Maybe I should mention that nationality means here ethnic group. Tibetan, Tibetans are part of a so-called na minority nationality in, in China. So where, were, where, where did it take place? In Repkong, Chapcha, and Machu, names which you might not be familiar with, but which are located, and here I show a map to show you the, the difference of location between self-immolations, 
and language-related protests. So language-related protests are located in a cluster of extremely vibrant intellectual life in Tibet, where most of Tibetans' poetry, literature, cinema is currently being produced. So there's a strong awareness of the importance of Tibetan education in that area, and you see it's not exactly the same places where self-immolations took place. Um, I also would like to point, at, to point to you that not only do students demonstrate, but there are new grassroots organizations in Tibet which show, um, which show the creation of local language su support organization. And I think this has gone quite unnoticed until now, but it's still part of the identity struggle that Tibetans are leading. And it shows also to us that not only can they be you know, passive victims, but they, they are also active defensors of their own identity. So I, this is may, maybe the point of my talk today. So here you see the membership card for a new association called Association for Mother Tongue Perpetuation. Uh, it was a group that was formed last year in around the same area where the protests took place. And uh, there are many such initiatives in Qinghai and Gensu, which is maybe mostly in Amdo-speaking areas. And you hear a lot about speak Tibetan only groups and associations where people pledge to speak only Tibetan among themselves. Also, on a more official level, the Qinghai National Aities University Tibetan Department, which is a provincial university with a strong Tibet, Tibetan department, has been organizing voluntary trips to Hualong, which is a um, um, a place in, in, uh, in the Tibetan plateau, mostly inhabited by Muslims now, but there is uh, like one third of the population is Tibetan, but they, ha they have been losing their language over the last five decades, and uh, the Qinghai Nationality University is sending groups of Tibetan students on a voluntary basis to go and teach Tibetan back to the people who say they are Tibetan, but they cannot say a word of Tibetan anymore. So, um, two, so far, 2,000 2, stu Tibetan students have been sent to these places. And as Lama Chap and um, the Chempemba said, we hear, we, 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 we watch, and we can see m more and more increasing number of poems, songs, shows, internet website, all celebrating Tibetan language. And I think it's no coincidence. So for instance, here's a picture of a play that was staged by children in Golok area, where Sonam uh, Soba, the last um, picture that Dechen Pemba showed us, the Rinpoche set himself a fire, on fire. Well, in that very area, uh, kids staged a play, created a play and staged it in tribute uh, to Tommy Sambota, who is the inventor of Tibetan script. Um, am I running out of time? Am I too quick? Is it okay? Five minutes. Okay, okay. Well, nice. I'm, I'm already reaching the conclusion anyway. So, as a conclusion, I maybe it's a more optimistic uh, way to look at things uh, that I want to put forward to you today. But don't worry, it, the end won't be so nice. So, first conclusion is quite optimistic. We see really an amazing number of new local small-scale organizations for education and support for Tibetan language burgeoning in Tibetan areas in the last two years. A growing number of poems and songs underscoring the importance of speaking Tibetan, writing Tibetan, using Tibetan. Uh, also, which it's not directly linked, but which I think has a link in the end, is that you also see a growing number of small-scale grassroots organizations with an ecological purpose, uh, with Tibetan green activists burgeoning in Tibetan areas and taking the fate of Tibetan on the Tibetan plateau into their hands. So we could say that there's a growing awareness and increasing private actions at grassroots level uh, so we can ask, is it the beginning of a Tibetan civil society based on acceptable and legal claims within the PRC's legal and ethnic framework? So does it, it means, is there a niche here for Tibetans to put forward their claims to their distinct identity and um, mm, scenery and the place where they live? But um, recently some prominent active green Tibetan activists have been arrested in 2010 and 11. So although being green is perfectly fine, if you are Tibetan and green, um, possibly the Chinese government may think there's a danger here for you to set up a grassroots uh, act, um, association. So there is a defiance all over the Chinese society and, even, and further even more when you are a Tibetan if you set up a grassroots initiative such as a local um, green NGO. 
Now back to the language. There have been a number of singers in intellectual arrested since 2008. That's possibly we're reaching the number of 80 to 90 people who've been arrested. Once again, it doesn't sound like it's a lot, but remember, 6 million Tibetan people, half of them can read, so we're back to 3 million people. Uh, you know, writers, not that many, think what it means, 70 uh, poets and writers and intellectuals in jail uh, at the same time. And another threat is that in February 2012, which is last month, uh, Du Weichun, who is the deputy head of the Communist Party's United Front Work Department of ch in charge of Tibetan affairs, that sounds like a very boring title, but these people are very important because they set uh, the direction for Tibet-related policies in China. Well, uh, Du Weichun called for the end of nationality labeling. Well, that sounds like it's nothing, but it's a threat, a very serious threat to Tibetan language education. Why? Because if um, uh, the label that you get when you're a Chinese citizen, when you are a Chinese citizen, you are, your ethnic affiliation is on your identity card. So when you're a Tibetan, it says you're a Tibetan, right? And if you're a Tibetan, uh, you have special rights to have two children, etc., etc. But also, um, you know, you need to provide education for the Tibetan people with the Tibetan language on the part of the state, etc. Well, if this gets erased, if there's no mention of what nationality, minority nationality you belong to, uh, then it means the Chinese state will have no problem destroying all these minority schools, minority <coughs> nationality schools that they have set up and that have nurtured this pool of Tibetan intellectuals and poets and writers who sustain now Tibetan identity through language. So um, we can see that, although it's, it's very soft to call for the defense of Tibetan language through protests, still uh, the Chinese government has been quick to see that there's a strong association between uh, speaking your language and being fluent in your own language and nurturing and fostering your own ethnic identity. So we should, uh, I wanted to make this point today so that people really become aware that they should really look into what the Chinese political maker, politi politicians say and be especially aware of the language of, that that, uh, the treatment that language receives in uh, China's overall policy. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about the software problem. Lama Jab confirms that Microsoft does support Tibetan language, but... Um, it does, yeah. uh, but it might be of an older version. Yeah. I mean, this computer might be a little yeah. bit old. Um, very good. Well, I'm now going to hand over to, uh, to, to Christina Oyuland. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's time to uh, put it... Um, forward to the, our second panel and I would like to ask our panelists so to join here the panel here please uh, Ramon and, uh, and Mr. Mann please would you like to come to join me here I once again thank you the panelists who were here in the first part and um, we are still expecting um, uh, another colleague um, Mr. Saba Sogur uh, joining us later on and um, we don't uh, have uh, yet uh, anybody from uh, European Ex External Action Service, unfortunately, but uh, let's hope that um, the person who was confirmed, that he will uh, join us uh, uh, today a little bit later on. But uh, let me say also a few introductory uh, words to the second panel, which is about the EU response uh, to the Tibetan crisis. Um, well, the European Parliament has been adopting uh, several uh, resolutions, uh, very strong ones. Uh, um, yes, another colleague is welcoming. Welcome to the panel. So, uh, uh, we have been adopting uh, the um, uh, quite uh, strong and, and clear uh, resolutions uh, if we look back um, uh, over the last year here in this parliament, but uh, we must um, confess that uh, the actions uh, from the part of the European uh, Union Council or the Commission has been not uh, 
as uh, clear, as strong, uh, but uh, we should also understand that uh, European uh, External Action Service has been in, in force, in, in action, only a little bit uh, more than one year. Because when we started uh, the series of these conferences three years ago, even the Lisbon Treaty was not in force. So uh, I would say that um, uh, in, in, in one hand, uh, we would like to see uh, moving uh, much faster forward. But at the same time, of course, we should uh, realize uh, the, uh, the capacities what the European Union has uh, uh, got. Nevertheless, um, uh, the ES is now um, existing and, and working. And uh, I think that uh, the idea that um, European Union uh, should appoint uh, the spatial coordinator for Tibetan affairs, as it was proposed, uh, uh, one of the previous speakers here, uh, is a very good idea that uh, should be considered very seriously. And uh, this uh, idea, I think, has really uh, good um, uh, perspective, uh, um, not only uh, possibly resolving uh, peacefully the Tibetan issue, and not only raising uh, on um, uh, more um, uh, adequate uh, um, way with the Chinese counterpart of the issue of, of Tibet, but I would say it would be also very, very important moral support to Tibetan people who are fighting uh, for their freedoms. And uh, as concerns also the um, uh, proposals and very, very strong asks from the previous uh, speaker, uh, Roy Strider, who has raised this issue already in previous panels here last year. It's about uh, the forming, setting up the European Parliament delegation to visit Tibet. I think this idea is, is not really dead. And uh, we should work further with, uh, with this idea. And, and uh, I must say that last year, when His Holiness uh, uh, Dalai Lama visited Estonia, uh, my country, then, uh, and I met, I had the honor to, to meeting him, I proposed uh, to His Holiness that if uh, European Parliament will be able to set up the delegation and uh, preparing uh, to go to Tibet, then it would be very good if also His Holiness could consider joining this delegation and using the opportunity visiting Tibet himself as well. Because since uh, the late 50s, when he had to escape from Tibet, he hasn't been back there. So uh, we, we haven't really put this idea aside, uh, and, uh, and, um, and uh, we should work together to uh, to get it happening one day. But now I would, I would stop here myself. And uh, first, I'm uh, very pleased to welcome uh, the chairman of um, uh, European Parliament uh, Tibetan uh, Intergroup, um, uh, Mr. Thomas Mann, who um, is uh, working um, also very hard here in the parliament to keeping uh, the issue of uh, Tibet uh, in our agenda. Please, uh, Mr. Mann, you have a floor. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Christina, and ladies and gentlemen. I've prepared a short speech about uh, five items. First of all, the Tibet Day on March 10. On the 10th of March 2012, thousands of people in the whole world were demonstrating. We remembered the National Tibetan Uprising in 1959. People of all generations were meeting in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, and the Philippines. In Japan, India, and Australia, our message was the same. The freedom of the Tibetan people is impartable. We showed our solidarity to the protection of the Tibetan language, spirituality, culture, and identity. In Frankfurt, Germany, I had a speech in front of more than 350 people. We participated in a demonstration in the city center to the Hauptwache and had a protest march towards the Chinese consulate. My speech also was uh, um, uh, in Munich and also in Berlin because they said some elements should be integrated there to demonstrate their solidarity. We protested against the ongoing torture of monks and nuns. Others were forced to the so-called patriotic education. When the wave of imprisonment, ratchets, and controls did not decline, some Tibetans saw no other choice than committing suicide. These self-immolations 
are a sign of helplessness. Their death as a sign of their immense suffering may not remain for nothing. Number two, the support by the European Parliament. Since 1989, there has been a TVIT intergroup in the Parliament. We are more than 100 MEPs. Once a month, experts gave us an account on the actual situation. They have already traveled to Tibet or are responsible for the people living in exile. We regularly organize conferences here in Brussels. The last year's highlight was a meeting with over 300 participants in November. The keynote speech was Dr. Lop Sang Sangai, the Prime Minister of the Exiled Tibetans. He visited the European institutions uh, here in Brussels for the first time. Several months ago, my colleagues and I, we had the experience, the democratic uh, elections of the exiled Tibetans. We were observers in India and Nepal, in Great Britain, Belgium, and Switzerland. In October 27, uh, in 2011, the European Parliament voted a joint motion for a resolution on self-immolations in Tibet. It was accepted with a broad majority. The Tibet Intergroup has uh, invented repeatedly on the High Representative for Foreign Affairs of the European Union and was successful. During the official dialogue between the European Union and China, it was requested to finally stop the oppression of the religious freedom. Recently, the state-owned website China Tibet Online accused the Dalai Lama of encouraging the Tibetans to their self-immolations. Furthermore, on this homepage, it was said that the Dalai Lama shared ideas of racial segregation. He would like non-Tibetans to be displayed from Tibet, and the dreadful quote was, the remarks of the Dalai Lama remind us of the uncontrolled and cruel Nazi or Nazi during the Second War. This was one of the most radical reactions of Chinese authorities until now. Number three, impact, a worldwide parliamentarian solidarity. Since November 2009, with the declaration of Rome, I was available there. Members of the European Parliament have been working together with parliamentarian in Australia, in Canada, India, and elsewhere. 150 members from 33 national parliaments belong to the INPAT, International Network of Parliamentarians on Tibet. We develop resolutions, coordinate campaigns, and design long-term strategies. In September 2010, we met in Bülakupé in India, in November 2011 here in Brussels, and in April, uh, we will meet in Ottawa in Canada. Number four, the visit of Kelsan Gyaltsen in the European Parliament. On March 20, the envoy of His Holiness the Dalai Lama to Europe, Kelsan Gyaltsen, he attended a meeting with the MEPs and their assistants. There were also Tibetan presidents who study at universities in Poland, in Ireland, Great Britain, and Belgium. Mr. Gelsen stressed the importance of the strong European support, and he declared it's a high time for the European Union to act on Tibet. Concerning a proper visit of the Dalai Lama in the EP, all groups should support uh, this attendance. Mm -hmm. I hope so. The European Union is an inspiring example for universal responsibility, an essential step of an effective role in resolving the Tibetan problem peacefully would be the renewed appointment of a specialist for Tibetan affairs. So my last remark, the special coordinator for Tibet. We should demand again a special envoy for Tibet according to the model of the United Minister for Foreign Affairs. For many years, we called the Council and the European Commission to install this coordinator who is responsible for the ongoing dialogue between the European Union and China and also bring forward the dialogue between the Chinese government and the Dalai Lama. It's not enough to establish a person being responsible only for human rights in the European Commission, in my opinion. A special coordinator for Tibetan affairs is of utmost importance. We should adopt a resolution in the European Parliament to renew our appeal. Mm -hmm. This initiative is a sign of solidarity 
I hope you will support it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Mann. And uh, now I would like to call our another colleague uh, from the Parliament, uh, um, Mrs. Uh, Lichtenberger. Please, you have a floor. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I'm uh, together with Thomas Mann uh, um, in the uh, Tibet inter working in the Tibet intergroup since years on uh, the issue of uh, raising attention for the uh, case of Tibet. And uh, I am also, which might some of you surprise, a member of the China delegation. I did this uh, being aware of uh, the harsh opposition of the China's uh, counterparts. Uh, I would encounter mentioning the, 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 the Tibet issue. But nevertheless, I think we should try really to be present where uh, uh, there is a possibility to influence. So in this uh, function, I was uh, in the last period uh, of the uh, European Parliament uh, visiting Tibet with the China delegation. So if someone says that um, European parliamentarians wouldn't be able to su uh, survive uh, at 3,000 meters, it's absurd we did. Huh? <laughs> Only one of us had slight problems, but the rest uh, was uh, well capable of uh, uh, being at that height without uh, falling apart or something like that. So these are simple excuses which I do not accept. Um, but um, I just want to tell you a few words about this delegation visit. Of course, it was organized by our Chinese counterparts and they showed us what they wanted to show us. Nevertheless, people understood the situation of the Tibetans within Tibet because we learned to look at it. We saw what was happening and we saw evidence. And uh, only looking at the social uh, differences between uh, the city of Lhasa being more or less a Chinese city and uh, the Tibetans only in some lower positions. Um, the way in which we were guided through, you know that the streets were closed when our caravan was passing, so we didn't even see traffic passing by. Um, we got a lively impression on the way Tibetans have to live. So I think uh, it is very important, and it could be a good tool, to have a look at uh, what is happening uh, in Tibet um, by sending a ad hoc committee or something like that. But these also have to be specialists on human rights issues too. It's not enough just to send a delegation of people um, it has to be also someone included that is really aware of the situation and is dealing with it. So we already had contact with the Human Rights Committee subcommittee just to join forces and maybe also combine um, for a delegation. But unfortunately, our president of the China delegation, um, well, how to say it politely, um, is not the one that's really going for human rights issues uh, at the first place. Uh, well, uh, this, uh, of course, is a little bit of a problematic situation, and uh, um, I was hoping that the leadership would change, but it didn't. Um, but anyway, this we can't stop there. And um, as long as I have possibilities to uh, uh, mention the issue and to raise the attention, also within the China delegation, I do, of course. For me, this is a very important thing. Second point is um, I was representing the European Tibet Intergroup 
at uh, the inauguration of the new Tibetan leading team in, uh, of the Tibetans in exile in Dharamsala in last summer. And I was happy to see there not only uh, representatives from uh, the United States and from um, uh, the other regions in the world, but also Chinese people. And this is one of the hopes I have that the young people, the bloggers in China, China, get more and more aware that, this, that the story that they are told by their government, that these are repo, uh, some very old-fashioned uh, reactionary uh, monk-led uh, uh, persons up there in the mountains uh, 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 being part of the protest, but this is a much broader and much more important movement. And I think that this is a very important process that we also should try to help to happen. Uh, still, I think that uh, a special envoy would be a very important step also for the European Parliament, because together with the US uh, special envoy, there could be a new impetus in reaching a solution. We have to say that within the European member states, the EU member states, we, re we actually have a situation that they uh, are much more afraid from the economic, uh, of the economic power of China than this has been the case for years and years. This is a growing problem for keeping the attention on the Tibetan issue. The member states um, see their short-term uh, profits very um, clearly, even if sometimes they might even get problems in, in the long run. But uh, we have less and less support from national governments as we had from some member states in the years before. This we have to say, and we have to plan our reactions on that. Because the situation, which has been uh, much clearer for a broader public, also uh, brought upon by the uh, self-emulation, is getting worse and worse. And I watched that, and it, it's really heartbreaking to see that. And what? we can do uh, to really bring about a change within the Chinese leadership is one of the, for me, a leading questions. We have to find solutions. It is our obligation also as members of the European Union, as members of the European Parliament, to protect human rights and to help minority rights which is, in that case, concerning Tibet, a wording which has to be seen as uh, just a little bit of a problem. It is a minority within the Chinese population, but it is a majority in its own region. So to sort that out is very important. I know the demographic change that, uh, changes that are happening and I know that this will make every solution for Tibet in the form of a enhanced autonomy much more difficult than it had been some 10 years before. But nevertheless, uh, I can assure you, um, we are trying to do our best to raise the attention to bring about a change, but be aware that the situation for our attempt to improve uh, the dramatic uh, uh, situation in Tibet is getting also uh, more difficult every year. Some small hope is existing in maybe the new leadership, but this has to be clarified within the next month. So, Thank you very much for your intention. I was talking a little bit about practical issues, which is sometimes much more difficult 
but I think you're waiting for that, and uh, I want to answer that request. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lichtenberger. Sometimes the practical um, uh, issues are very practical, <laughs> I would yeah. say. And uh, of course, we need um, to be combining the uh, practical issues with the political issues. But uh, now we can then move uh, forward. And I have my, on my right hand my good uh, colleague from my own group, from my liberal group, uh, Mr. Ramon Tremosa, uh, Ipa Paltzels. Paltzels. <laughs> Please, you have a floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Ramon Tremosa, as Cristina said. I, I am from Barcelona. I come from Catalonia, and I represent here in the parliament the, the Catalan Liberal Party, which now is the first party in Catalonia running the government, the regional government, and also the, the city hall of Barcelona and many other Catalan municipalities. Well, let me, uh, I will only speak three, four minutes, but let me use one minute just to make some parallelisms because as a Catalan, as uh, I can understand the feelings of Tibetan people maybe better than uh, any other European colleague here in this house because as you may know, Catalan language has been forbidden during centuries in Spain. And for instance, in 1940, the last, uh, the, the last uh, Catalan president of the regional government before the dictatorship was killed and shot by the Spanish dictatorship, Franco. And now, under the Spanish democracy, uh, it is true that Catalan language is co-official in Spain, but I could give examples on which is the situation of a bilingual system, as it was said in the, in the last uh, intervention before us, uh, here in the, in the table. So, so maybe Catalonia can be a, a model for the Tibetan people if they have to deal in the next uh, years with a bilingual system. The potentials, but also the risks that, that, that uh, an offer from the Chinese government can, can represent for Tibetan language. So, uh, and, and, and before, before uh, going uh, to some Tibetan issues, let me also express that Europe is, is a hope for Catalans. And I will give you an example, a, a, a very beautiful paradox. The new president of the European Parliament, uh, Martin Schulz, is an expert on Catalan literature. It is incredible for us, but, but let me explain to you that that, as you may know, in 2007, in Frankfurt, every year we have uh, the, the most important fair, the book, the book mess in the world. And in 2007, the Catalan language was invited, was the, the culture, the literature invited in this, in this year. And it, was, it supposed a boom for many Catalan writers. And for instance, Jaume Cabré was translated to German and has sold more than one million books in German language. And for instance, uh, the new president, Martin Schulz, is an expert and has read all of his books. And, and we have now the paradox that uh, Martin Schulz is in favor to authorize a, a, a certain use in plenary of the Catalan language, and the, and the Spanish MEPs are against this possibility. But, but this is for us is a very, a very uh, uh, hopeful um, history just to, to be told here, uh, because Catalan is not allowed to be spoken here in this house. So this is the reason why, why I always speak in English, never I speak, use the Spanish language in plenary and committees and in the group. Well, uh, uh, just uh, I am here to say you, Tibetan people, that I, I, I am here to give you uh, all my support. I am here to denounce Chinese authorities who still continue undermining religious, cultural, and linguistic rights of the Tibetan people. And I am here to, to keep the pressure with other MEPs that we have to push uh, the European Commission to have a more active role in defending European values, in defending Tibetan rights. So uh, I am ready to table more written uh, parliamentary questions to the commissions and to join to more uh, parliamentary initiatives to remind the European Commission which are the values that we have always defended and which 
defines Europe as a as a an island of freedom and democracy and and, and human rights. And I am also here to to to, to say and to remind you. Uh, it is not necessary, but I I let me explain our experience as, as Catalans that, that non-violence is and remains the best instrument to achieve freedom in our rights. We, we can exchange opinions and experiences as, a, as, as an European country, uh, but, but uh, uh, in any case, uh, as Dalai Lama says, uh, please do not use violence in your uh, resistance to the Chinese authorities because it will be, it is not easy to resist temptation, but, uh, and, and, and as a Catalan I can tell it uh, to, to you, but, but remain pacific, you will have more chances and, and uh, to, to maintain your, your culture and your rights in the future. And finally, let me, let me uh, say you a final idea that, that you could use as an argument. For instance, I, I come now from a debate with uh, on Kosovo, because tomorrow the parliament will probably vote uh, a report uh, uh, inviting Kosovo to start negotiations to join the European Union. And I, I have, uh, I come from the plenary, and I, I said, uh, I, I celebrate that Kosovo will will start negotiations with the European Union. And and there were there were only very few uh, uh, MEPs. Uh, against this possibility, and, and they were Spanish. And I thought, I thought why uh, 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 some Spanish maps are against this possibility. And, and Spain is like China and Russia, one of the few countries that has not yet recognized Kosovo's independence. So let me say, Tibetans, you, you, can, you can use a very uh, powerful argument. A free Tibet will suppose will mean a free China. Freedom for Tibet will suppose a democratic China. So uh, you have to insist on your demands and you have to say, now China is growing economically, now China is increasing its wealth, there is a lack of, of uh, democratic values and respect for human rights, but if you say our freedom will suppose for you Chinese also an increase of democratic values. So this, this, in this way, your demand can also represent a, a, a better standard uh, evaluation of the Chinese uh, uh, role in the world. And, and finally, please Tibetans keep the pressure on us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ramon, uh, very much indeed um, for your uh, sharing uh, the experience uh, from uh, Catalonia. And I must say that, uh, at least in our group, this issue is, um, is quite often on, uh, on in agenda. So, uh, but now, uh, last but not least, um, I'm very glad that uh, today uh, we have also a representative from the European External Action Service. We have Dr. Gerhard, Gerhard uh, Sabatil with us. Um, this is the first time when uh, this uh, conference series uh, have got um, a representative from the Commission, and uh, you may have already noticed and heard uh, the voices of the members of the European Parliament, uh, and I'm sure that you were briefed uh, uh, what our previous uh, speakers uh, representing, uh, representing uh, Tibet uh, have, uh, have said earlier in the first part of, of our uh, conference, uh, so we, we are very keen and interested in to listening uh, to your comments and, uh, and ideas, and why not a vision? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, President of the Intergroup, dear members, ladies and gentlemen. You are right, it's my first time with you, because I'm the Director of East Asia only since January this year. But I'm for some years already the coordinator of the EU for the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations, where we deal also with intercultural, interreligious issues. 
In fact, I'm more a specialist on Catalonia still, because my grandsons live there, uh, than uh, for Tibet. But nevertheless, I will make an effort uh, to uh, satisfy your request for information and discussion about this uh, very important issue today. You know all uh, that while the EU does not question that Tibet is an integral part of China, at the same time it's greatly concerned about the lack of progress on the ground on human rights in general and on Tibet in particular. The EU is concerned that the recent distressing cases of self-immolation of some 30 Tibetans, as well as reports of increasingly violent measures used to suppress protests in the Tibetan regions and the apparent tightening of government control over monasteries. We have raised its, our concerns regarding Tibet at the last EU-China Human Rights Dialogue, 16 June next year. The next will take place this year in spring, May, June, through two demarches on 9 December 2011 and just two weeks ago on 7 March. At a meeting with Chu Wai Kun, Executive Vice Minister of the United Front Work Department last December, at the last China summit in uh, February, 14 February, as well as at the United Nations Human Rights Council recently on 6 March. I can say we use exactly each and every opportunity to raise the issue with the Chinese authorities, also in the forthcoming events. Uh, and uh, we, our message has always been quite consistent. We have expressed our concerns regarding, first, increasing legal restrictions on religious practice in Tibet, second, limitations on teaching of the Tibetan language, third, the ongoing official campaign against Tibetan intellectuals and cultural figures, fourth, the harsh measures taken against any Tibetan attempting to protest against official policies, and fifth, the impact of the mass forced resettlement of nomads in Tibetan culture. Furthermore, the EU has expressed, number six, its profound anxiety regarding the series of self-immolations, and seventh, called on the Chinese authorities to allow all Tibetans, including monks, to exercise their cultural and religious rights without hindrance, and finally, eight, to refrain from the use of force against peaceful protests. In their responses, the Chinese authorities have largely dismissed the EU's concerns and emphasized that Chinese policies in Tibet had led to economic development and to enormous benefits. China claimed that the series of self-immolations is instigated by forces that want to destabilize Tibet. While taking note of the Chinese position, the EU can only conclude that the growing number of Tibetans choosing to take such tragic steps demonstrates a profound depth of feeling among many Tibetans that their religious, linguistic and cultural rights are not being respected. The EU acknowledged the priority the Chinese leadership gives to maintaining territorial integrity and economic growth in minority areas such as Tibet. However, as the recent tragic self-immolations make all too clear, economic development is not a panacea. We therefore strongly encourage China at all occasions to create conditions which will allow the Tibetan people fully to exercise their political, religious and cultural rights in line with the Chinese constitution and the Chinese legal provisions on local autonomy. We will use all appropriate avenues to continue to pass this message to the Chinese authorities. Regarding the matter which you discussed before, the appointment of a special coordinator, we have still the position that this would not add value to the work already undertaken by the ES to engage China on this issue. Moreover, the EU takes the view that an EU envoy would most likely be prevented by China from playing an effective role on the ground as China categorically refuses any international mediation. In this context, also the US envoy has never been allowed to visit the Tibetan Autonomous Region. Finally, we hope that the dialogue between the envoys of the Dalai Lama and the Chinese government, which regrettably has been frozen, will resume soon, since we strongly believe that only this dialogue 
can lead to positive results, aiming at resolving outstanding issues in a peaceful and sustainable way for Tibet. And we will, of course, express these viewpoints also at the next opportunities to our Chinese partners again and again. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for this um, information, uh, what you are sharing with us. We come back later uh, to this, uh, hopefully, when, when we have the questions time. Uh, but now uh, I'm very pl glad to welcome another colleague uh, from the Parliament uh, who was uh, probably busy with the other commitments in the plenary because you know there is uh, our plenary session is uh, taking place in parallel uh, this afternoon in this house. So, um, please, uh, Mr. Sabo Shogor, uh, who uh, just joined us, uh, you have a floor, please. Thank you. I'm sorry coming so late, but uh, I tried and I succeed to get the, the eye, to catch the eye of the president to speak for, for the independence of Kosovo and to speak uh, for the autonomy autonomy and minority rights of, of Hungarians, Romanians living in Serbia. So as you see, in the European Union, we have still a lot of things to do and we need to do because uh, we need to g give a good example to the Chinese. Look to the Union, you look to the European Union, that's the way how to treat minorities. But uh, we still are facing the problem, we even don't know what means multiculturalism, and in my country, Romania or Slovakia or Greece, I'm sorry if I'm hurting somebody, uh, we are the, be the worst students of Europe because still there is no trust and loyalty between majority and minority. And uh, this is what uh, we can do to help the Chinese, to give them a good model. We needed the Fukushima to take serious the environmental issues. Then we needed the financial catastrophe, almost a financial catastrophe, uh, Greece, in Greece or in Spain, in, in Ireland or in, in uh, Italy, but mainly in Greece, to take serious the, the budget and financial issues and not spending more than we are earning. And I was putting the question, when we will have in Europe or in the world, an ethnic catastrophe to take serious all these problems. And we had already in the, in the Western Balkans, when people were killed in front of European soldiers who were just watching them, how they are killing innocent people. And then we have the ethnical catastrophe in, in China or in, in Burma, in Myanmar. I'm just coming from there. I was there last month and second time Burmese authorities, they are cheating and treating badly the minorities because they promised them a federal state and rights to the minorities and they're still missing from the constitution. And of course, uh, I, you should apologize me if I'm speaking about all these things a little bit uh, not very cool, but with more emotion because I am also Hungarian coming from Romania minority, especially coming from the tribe and the region of Alexander Kuroshi, who made the first Tibetan uh, dictionary and grammar, because probably we are coming from that part of Asia. Uh, we left, of course, uh, in the fifth, eighth, and ninth century Asia and coming to Europe. And we are one of those Europeans who are keeping a lot of Asiatic heritage in our region. So Tibet and human rights and minority rights issues are inside in our heart and in all our talks. And I am like my uh, colleague and friend, Mr. Marinesco would say, like uh, the Joseph Heller's uh, uh, Roman, uh, the, the trap of 22, that they, from football to culture, I'm always going to the issue of minorities. And uh, it's a very difficult issue. I couldn't convince my very strict Protestant Dutch business people to not make business in China if they are real Christians, uh, to not help them uh, because they are not treating, uh, well, it was 20 years ago, the minorities. But you see, even we cannot uh, oblige United States or some, uh, some uh, European uh, member states president 
to to treat and invite and uh, and uh, speak uh, with His Holiness uh, the Dalai Lama uh, in the front door and not on the back door of the Parliament or the White House, and and this is a shame of not just China but European member states and political leaders and the United States because we are afraid of the Chinese money and the Chinese economical power. And this is a shame of Europe and we cannot even quote on, on Christian roots and heritage if, if we are closing our eyes and mouth and, and we are doing nothing. I'm always telling to the Romanians and other big nations that ask the minorities if they feel themselves good and well. We lost one million people in, in, in Romania, one million Hungarians in 90 years. We don't want to leave. We are the most trustful uh, citizens of this country. We are ruling, trying to rule the country, never entering in the Ministry of Defense, Finance, internal or external, but always getting health, uh, environment and culture. But we do our best, but they still don't trust us. And that's the same, nobody can tell me that in Tibet everything is okay, because ask the Tibetans, why are they refugees? Why are self-immolation? Self-immolation is, you know, we Christians, we, we, we say that suicide is not a good way, but that some people and a nation start to suicide themselves, that means that it's, a, it's the highest and biggest trouble in that country. And uh, <clears throat> what else we can do? Ask everything what we are doing each month in Tibet Intergroup and here to, to do uh, and to find the best solution to change the mind of the Chinese authorities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sokor, very much uh, for your comments. Uh, and now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a um, uh, little bit time for um, the questions or comments or, of course, proposals are also most welcome uh, from uh, the hall. Uh, now the floor is open. If you ask the question, please also introduce yourself. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, uh, giving this opportunity to put my proposal or kind of a point of view regarding the Tibet issue. Uh, first of all, I really want to give a light on uh, the self emulations As some people, they describe it as an act of desperation, a suicide, or some kind of forbidden in a Buddhist perspective. So I, read, uh, I used to read a Buddhist uh, scripture, and, and there's a scripture in which call you can a devotion where you, uh, you have a single pointedly devotion, devotion toward your master. And uh, when you go through teachings of Buddhists, you have to give up a lot of bad habits and all this bad thinking, bad speech, uh, bad, thing, uh, bad behavior, everything. So uh, people can give up all these things, but still, uh, there's uh, one monk uh, who is uh, practicing uh, Buddhist on that time. He feel that he, after giving up all this bad habit about mind, purity of mind, body, speech, but still he doesn't feel uh, like you know, he has uh, really uh, feel the crosses towards his master. So he, give, he burn himself and uh, he make a lamb of his body. So I think there's a purity between him and his devotion towards his master. So I think that what is happening in Tibet, I think that is a complete sign of a complete devotion, a single faith um, between the Dalai Lama and Tibetan people. And I think that is the one of the most courageous and the most brave thing that nobody can do. Then secondly, regarding this uh, 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 dialogue between the, uh, you know, the Tibetan government exile and the Chinese. Uh, whenever there's a dialogue and Chinese government, they never recognize uh, Tibet as uh, like greater Tibet. They only recognize uh, autonomous region of Tibet, which is partly of Tibet. Now, talking about the greater Tibet, you have to think to the, talk about the, what is the problem happening now, the Gansu and Situn province, where a lot of emulations are happening now. The uh, Chinese has never recognized there's any problem in this, those provinces. So I think it's very important now to, you know, to highlight that there's a problem in the, those areas too, where there's Tibetan people are living. So it's a very uh, high, uh, time to recognize this point too. And thirdly, the, you know, the ultimate solution for the Tibet problem, I think, I believe, um, there's a, we Tibetan have a problem with Chinese government. It's uh, well known now. 
And uh, Tibetan people now in Tibet, they don't recognize Chinese governments uh, now as their representative. And uh, secondly, Chinese people themselves, I think they have a lot of problems regarding human rights and uh, economics, environment, everything. And thirdly, in terms of European Union and the other part of the world, uh, you have a lot of problems dealing with Chinese government, uh, be it in terms of economic, uh, human rights, uh, promotion of religious freedom, and also uh, regarding uh, environment. So, so when we have all these problems, it's a problem is because of Chinese Communist Party. It's, a not, it's not a legitimate government. It's a, uh, they are a single party, party and uh, they have a power, they have a lot of money, so that's the reason why they are ruling. And uh, if you look at Chinese uh, expense uh, regarding the internal security and the military, nowadays Chinese Communist Party, they are spending more on internal security than that of military. That means the Chinese government, they themselves doesn't trust their own people. Such a kind of government, I think if they don't trust their people, I think there's no point to be a government. So I think it's very high time now. Everybody has a problem with Chinese government, Communist Party. So I think it's uh, time to declare Chinese Communist Party as an uh, illeg illegitimate government. So this is my point. I think we should together. In the world, there are 7 billion people. I think if we can sign a, a petition about 4 billion people to convince them that to recognize Chinese government as an illegitimate government, I think we won the battle. Thing. So I think we need to really think about that, the declaration of Chinese Communist Party is illegitimate government. Thank you very much. Thank you for your remarks, and uh, I suggest that I will take uh, some other few questions from uh, the hall, and then we can uh, have this um, uh, final uh, response and conclusions, please. Who else is willing to share your views or would like to put any question? Yes, I see two of them. Yes, Professor, please. First. Yes, if I heard you right, um, the European Union does not approve uh, the appointment of uh, Tibet. Um, I sorry, I don't have the, the word, but um, special, special coordinator. coordinator. Am I right? That is my first question. Uh, even th and, and my comment about that, if I'm right, if I've heard correctly, then. Um, even though this person might not be allowed to go into China and go on a fact-finding mission or whatever, at least it would show the commitment of the Europe European Union to the, towards the Chinese government. That would make a point. Um, second, second thing, um, I, uh, it's, it's related to, to what the person just before me said. When you talk about Tibet and when Chinese people talk about Tibet, be careful because you're not talking about the same Tibet. When you talk with your Chinese counterparts and talk about Tibet, Xizhang in Chinese, and I'm sure you go through translators, they only think of Tibet autonomous region. So it's half of Tibet and half of Tibetans. So if they deny you the entry to Tibet, well, then take their word for it and say, okay, then when we go to other Tibetan areas, which are not in Tibet autonomous region, but always make it clear what Tibet you're talking to, and please try and have an access to not Tibetan autonomous region areas where many T Tibetan people live and undergo the same problems. As my colleague said, many people set themselves on fire in these areas too. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, also, Mr. Chop, you have the question. Uh, one of my questions already asked by Professor François Robin. Um, I think um, the other point is that um, I think it's the wrong attitude to hold that uh, you know Chinese do not do not listen uh, if we approach to them this way or with this kind of institutions or with a, a special a position of a special coordinator, which I totally disagree. Uh, I think the point that Tibetans have been making for the last 60 years and that the point what we are, have been doing is that, yes, sometimes it might feel a certain desperate or a sense of desperation is there, maybe. But uh, I agree with my fellow Tibetan over there that the self-emulations, these self-emulations, I think, should not be interpreted as some kind of act of desperate, desperation. What we're trying to do is that trying to make 
the Chinese government listen. They may not be listening. They may not have, maybe they're trying to turn a blind sort of eye and a deaf ear to Tibetan issue, but it's there. And what is happening is that I think in terms of China, in terms of, in terms of uh, contemporary Chinese politics, uh, what the Tibetan issue does is that Tibetan issue uh, transcends uh, the issue of Tibetan nation. It's not a question of just Tibetan people. And we are the critical voice within contemporary China. And we have been the critical voice since the foundation of so-called People's Republic of China. So we have never stopped questioning Chinese authority, Chinese power, and Chinese policies inside Tibet since the Chinese uh, PLA and um, communist personnel set foot on the Tibetan soil, as I pointed earlier. So since the 1950s, 60s, and then in the 80s, it's the Tibetans who rose before, well before the 1989, the famous Tiananmen Square uprising. Tibetans rose in, the, in 1987 and 88 and 89. And so what, and then in the 90s and now in the new millennium, what I'm trying to say is that we are not only speaking for ourselves, but we are actually questioning the Chinese government within, on the behalf of the citizens, on entire Chinese citizens, not just Tibetans, and the, both Han and the, the other minorities. So actually, I have a problem with the word minority. We are not a minority. We are our own nation. That's one thing. I think the other thing is from a, what that in the future annals of, you know, in the future historical annals, I think Tibetans will have also a global role where that we are one of the first forces that questioned Chinese superpower. And where the one, on a global level, we have been questioning and that as well. So and what I'm trying to say, I guess, here is that we cannot give up or we cannot express certain statements or certain opinions or question certain attitudes, especially established authorities, because they do not listen. Thank you. Yes, and there is one more question over there, please. Thank you very much. My name is Yuri Slavrikov. I'm uh, originally from Latvia and I work in human rights. And the issue of Tibet is very close to me from different angles. Being of uh, Latvian origin, we, we went through 50 years of, in a way, similar history as Tibet is still going on. And being Buddhist, I mean, I'm very close to Tibetan culture. And my comment and the question is towards uh, Mr. Sabatil. I was extremely disappointed by the <clears throat> explanations given about the Commission's approach. Basically, the story is our opposition, we, we are making points, and the Chinese government is uh, basically uh, not reacting, etc. So I wanted to say, ask what is the rationale be behind, firstly, not appointing a special coordinator on Tibetan issue? I didn't get quite uh, an explanation what's the reasoning behind. And the second is what is the longer-term strategy of the European Commission uh, in terms of dealing with the issue? Because the explanation given so far where I keep raising issue is not a really, um, there is no longevity in such a strategy. I would like to hear a little bit more what is the being planned in order to raise and actually resolve these issues directly with uh, with Chinese government. Thank you. Well, I think it's time now to turn uh, back to the panel and uh, I would suggest that first we start from, from uh, Commission, uh, from uh, Dr. Sabatil, as long uh, to you, uh, there are several questions. Uh, would you like to start to respond, please? So again, I'm not speaking for the Commission, but for the external service of the European Union, just on the line, because we are a new body and uh, we like to be uh, recognized as acting uh, on behalf of the High Representative, special, uh, the High Representative, the Vice President of the Commission, Lady Ashton, in this regard. And what I said before on the uh, special coordinator, and it was raised now uh, twice again, is just to make uh, our point clear that uh, an appointment of a person, of a function as such, in our viewpoint, is not on purpose in itself. It should have some results, some success, some added value. And we uh, see at the example of the US Special Envoy that this uh, added value up to now is, is lacking. 
So to send a signal by such an appointment on the other side uh, could even more antagonize the Chinese position in this regard as we assess this from the viewpoint of these many instances where we have raised the issue with the Chinese side. So uh, to appoint a person who at the end uh, just sits back in Brussels and uh, cannot travel where he should go and uh, uh, will contribute rather to the hardening of positions than to talk about uh, issues and we do this again and again and again and diplomacy is in, in uh, it's mostly talking, speaking, convincing, persuading and this is what we, what we can do. What is also clear that uh, if we appoint a special coordinator just for this region, you will not, we will not stay perhaps with this one, but there will be other issues. We are considering, you know this perhaps, that uh, a special representative for human rights globally, worldwide, should be undertaken, should be done by the High Representative Vice President Ashton for general human rights issues. Naturally, he would then deal with all regions. So we prefer very much that this is a thematic approach, as we do in other policy areas as well, and not uh, antagonizing the diplomatic efforts underway. Short term, mid term, long term, we are patient, but we put the pressure. We know what we could realistically uh, perhaps uh, achieve. I doubt whether you can just ask us, please resolve. It's not as easy as it's, you, you know this all. But uh, if the member states, uh, and I'm speaking under this condition, uh, would be ready to appoint a human rights coordinator, of course he will deal uh, with, the, with the issue and he will deal with other human rights issues in, in China and worldwide as well. But again, uh, just a signal which might at the end be, let me even say, counterproductive for the situation on ground is not uh, realpolitik in the sense as we try to undertake it. It might be disappointing for you to, so, to see us, but seriously, at least pondering all the issues. So I really, I'm really convinced that we could do more, help more, uh, achieve more. If we do this uh, by the means we have at hand already, we are uh, uh, using again and again. And uh, of course, we have so many areas where we discuss with uh, China, and this is an issue we'll up. This morning, I have uh, co-chaired with the Commission, in fact, uh, the launch of the third pillar of our China relations, the cultural pillar. We have an economic trade pillar for long, we have a political uh, pillar, you know, the High Representative will go for the strategic uh, dialogue to China beginning of July. And today, first time uh, before meeting uh, with the Chinese uh, counterparts, uh, 27 plus 1, 28, uh, the future member state also were around the table and we discussed how we can bring forward the cultural dialogue with China. And I said at the beginning of these meetings, we have a broad understanding of uh, cultural policy. Uh, we think uh, this culture is a base for human interaction in a free society in general. There are many issues uh, at stake in the field of culture, from the commercial, economic, up to the real matters of uh, artistic freedom. We have expressed our viewpoint that we will uh, deal not only with the <coughs> state artists, actors, writers, but also with all of them who have less or no relation with the authorities. Of course, this will be done uh, based on the cooperation of the member states, individually by the member states, in addition to us. <coughs> and uh, quite clear, this is also an issue uh, we discussed today, which falls under this rubric. So we have opened several channels. And I think this is the right way to, uh, how should I say, to, to embrace the issue in more general uh, terms and uh, try to do everything in order to get an improvement on the ground, which was also recognized at the last summit communique. So uh, the, the Chinese uh, side has undertaken a commitment to improve situation on ground. Generally, specifically, of course, we have a next summit already in autumn. 
And again, we will make the point and we have to look back what uh, if, if could happen in the meantime. So we are working hard on the issue, but I think the choice of the instruments, how we should work, should be left to those who are really involved, uh, not as me in short time, but long time already in the overall uh, issue and the handling of uh, Chinese uh, matters. And personally, I can just uh, tell you, yes, this is a matter of uh, high priority also for myself. And uh, after I was appointed uh, for this uh, function, and uh, when going to China uh, soon, uh, of course, it will be an issue as ever in our talks with the authorities. Yes, uh, of course, we need a dialogue, uh, but uh, also in this point, I would still uh, make a remark that uh, I'm actually uh, referring and quoting uh, uh, Roy Strider, who started with the words. Uh, this afternoon, he said that the uh, world is changing fast. And therefore, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really looking uh, to the future with a view that uh, one China policy does not have a future. And I think uh, this is uh, something also what we um, European political uh, actors uh, should uh, keep in mind. Uh, it doesn't uh, happen uh, perhaps next day, but... Um, in my view, this is the perspective. But now I would leave also uh, to my other colleagues uh, for the concluding remarks. I uh, ask you please uh, to fit in two, three minutes because again, as always here in this house, the time is pressing. Please, yeah. Mr. L uh, Mrs. Uh, Lichtenberger, please. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, taking up a little bit the ideas, I would say, okay, um, uh, enforcing the cultural pillars would, in my point of view, also concern uh, to foster the knowledge of Tibetan language, t Tibetan culture, and Tibetan heritage as a whole. Because this is, as we heard before, one of the uh, up to now non-discovered, non-disclosed treasures on our world. And I think that this really would make sense. Of course, this would not meet the wishes of uh, uh, the Chinese authorities, but I think this could be a way just to put at least another, or to open another way just to, to promote it. Um, if China talks about improvement of the situation on the ground, it's always uh, the question of the, the old political question of the cui bono, for, for whom is it good? Uh, because what we learned up to now, and this was also due to the visits we made, it was not the Tibetans that really um, had a large profit of the improvement, the so-called improvements on the ground. So I would say this has to be, in see, has to be in, uh, seen also in that light, that an improvement of the situation has to concern the Tibetans and not has to concern um, the Chinese people now living in, in, in Lhasa in, uh, at the first point. Uh, of course, I see also the background of the fear uh, in China to have kind of Arab or Chinese spring happening over there. And this might also be a reason for the tightening up of, of the whole situation. But it is clear, uh, if we give in as Europeans on that, um, although it's a difficult situation, um, according to the, to the nature of the European Union, to defend human rights also in these areas, we really would lose also credibility. Of course, we have problems at home. I agree with it. I was involved in the problem solving in my home region of uh, North Tyrol and Süd Tyrol, so I know about how long it takes and how difficult it is to negotiate. We took about negotiations for 30 years, but in the end we succeeded. So, um, of course, Italy is maybe not such a tough partner as, um, as China is. So just not to compare things that you can't compare. Eh? But anyway, my point is that uh, we have uh, just to defend our position even if we always have to defend it with dip uh, diplomatic tools. I'm sorry that we do not share the same point of view on uh, diplomatic um, 
tools to improve the situation concerning the, the envoy, uh, but let's work on it. I would be happy to do so. So, uh, and now I will turn to Mr. Sokor, please. Would you like to give your comments if you want to s say no? Or Ramon? Yes. Yeah, please. Okay, less than one minute. Uh, it could be interesting to to, to achieve uh, a public statement of High Representative Catherine Ashton yeah. on the cases of, of self-immolation. So let's let's work on it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, and now I would like to give uh, uh, the floor to Mr. Mann, uh, who is uh, chairman uh, and then uh, very experienced um, for all these years in, in this parliament. And um, once again, I appreciate very much that you joined us uh, this afternoon, uh, this meeting, and, and uh, I'm looking also forward to, to cooperate uh, with you in the future as well. But please, you have a floor. Thank you, Christina. So my recommendation for the Catalonian people is very clear. If you don't have the majority of the language, use another language, football. Always Barcelona is uh, beating uh, Real Madrid, uh, so it's not a problem. Uh, uh, and you have many fans, no doubt. Um, so uh, not, please uh, look to all the resolution of the European Parliament. Of course, we integrate the TAR, Tibetan Autonomous Region, but also the other Tibetan areas. In all the resolution of the Parliament, it's integrated there. And I can. Uh, can prove it because very often we have the same ideas. Also, we are there dealing with each other from different political groups, and in the end, we have the same vision. So it's very, very clear. It's not concentrated on the uh, TAR, no doubt. Number two, uh, the question of uh, is there is any possibility to, to convince the Chinese people? Of course, it's not easy. When very often we try to have a new government there, and also a new government, a new movement, new people, and so on. But nothing has changed. Only the people, as members of the Communist Party, are there. And it really is not easy to deal with them. Also, behind the doors or outside, when there is no microphone left, there is a possibility also to talk about this. But only it's a limited opportunity. Whenever the Chinese people are uh, going to some universities in the European Union, in the end, they know a little bit more. But then, when they go back to China, they have to fulfill all the rules, so it really is not easy. And that's why we know it. It's better to um, talk about this reality than to have big dreams. But the special coordinator, Mr. Sabatil, you know it very well. Since many years, we demanded in the European Parliament. And also, we saved money for having this position. And they, they played games. People from the European um, Commission said, we are not responsible. The Council is responsible. Then we asked the, the Council. And they said, no, the commission is responsible. No, everything is in one hand. The uh, interesting um, baroness from uh, <clears throat> Great Britain, from a small island uh, far away from the continent. Okay, So there is an opportunity, and EEAS should realize it. I think, uh, of course, one step is very important, to have a um, special coordinator for human rights. We know this. This could be a possibility. But... The Tibet item only as a minority question and not more. I think we, you can imagine we are not satisfied with the situation. We already had some official and unofficial talks, but this uh, should be, I think, another movement in the European Parliament. I think we should collect signatures here from the Parliament again to renew the appeal to have a special coordinator for Tibetan affairs. And I hope all the political parties in, here in the Parliament will support us. This is a very important sign also for the Tibetan inside living in Tibet, in TAR, and also other Tibetan re uh, regions, no doubt, to have a signal, you will never forget you. I hope this will be possible. Thank you very much. Tashi Dile. Yes, and um, uh, we have to conclude uh, this time uh, for this um, uh, conference, but um, I'm quite confident that this will be not the last one. We got today again a number of ideas on what uh, this parliament is going uh, to work further, continue working in the fields where we have been already working, uh, like uh, the special uh, envoy 
or uh, we are uh, preparing uh, to receive His Holiness um, uh, in this parliament, which is also very, very important. And as we heard today, also the, the idea of uh, setting up uh, a delegation uh, for visiting uh, Tibet is, is, is not dead, but it is uh, pretty alive. So uh, we have a lot of um, good ideas, and together with you, uh, with your support, with your mm -hmm. advice, we, we move uh, Forward, and I think there are many, many reasons to do so. Even here in this uh, hall, I appreciate this uh, very, very small boy. I guess uh, Tibetan, he's still there. We we have to work at least uh, for him. Now he lives here in free Europe, but uh, one day he may live in free Tibet. So let's work together to achieve it.